If you're anything like me, you've seen adverts for extended test drives and thought, they're not really going to give me a car unless I actually buy one. Well, I came across an advert for a 48 hour test drive with Mercedes, and seeing as I've never driven one before, I signed up. Only a few hours later, I got a call from a Sitna dealer who asked me which car I wanted and when I wanted it for. I asked for a C Class Cabriolet, but at the last minute, I was told that the car was sold, so they sorted me out with a C Class Coupe instead. All they needed from me was my driving license information and some reassurance that I was a genuine person with an interest in their cars. I told them that I currently have a BMW that's one year into its finance agreement, so I wasn't looking to buy a car anytime soon, but I did want to drive a Mercedes to see what it was like, and maybe in the future look into buying one if the test drive went well. On the day of the test drive I signed some digital paperwork for the insurance, and then a salesman showed me to the car. He showed me the basics of how to put it into gear, and adjust my seat and how to use the digital instrument cluster. He handed me the keys and I was off. It was really that simple. At the end of the test drive, before handing the car back, I fueled it back up and I gave my thoughts on the car to the salesman and I handed the keys back. I was never pressured into buying a car from them or even looking into the figures. The experience was great so a big thanks to sitting there in Bedford. Now on to the car itself. <laughs> So here we have a C200 Coupe. This car has a 1.5 litre four cylinder petrol engine making 184 horsepower. It also has something called EQ Boost, which is a small electric motor making an additional 14 horsepower, which boosts the car from low RPM to try and eliminate turbo lag. It's fitted with a nine speed automatic gearbox and it's rear wheel drive. This car is an AMG line edition premium which means it has some additional features on top of the AMG line, such as enhanced multi-beam LED headlights, memory package for the electric seats and mirrors, a 12.3 inch digital instrument cluster, 64 color interior ambient lighting, enhanced online functionality with the command online system, a mid-range sound system, and wireless mobile phone charging. The basic AMG line edition already comes as standard with a high specification. Some features include electric folding mirrors, 18 inch wheels, LED lights, collision prevention assistant, cruise control, privacy glass, parking assistant and a reversing camera. I personally really like the styling, from the exterior with its smooth lines and LED daytime running lights to the interior with the digital display and the bright ambient lighting. The car looks fantastic. Moving on to the technology built into this car, there's a wide variety of options and settings to control it all. The individual option allows you to configure your own driving mode rather than using the pre-configured comfort or sport settings. You can select a comfort drive with sport steering for example. Inside assistance you will find all of the safety based features with my favourites being the parking assist and the traffic sign recognition.
consumption will reveal the average fuel economy since the trip was last reset. The graphic is nice but I prefer a more easy to read informational based display. Light settings allows you to choose which colour and how bright the interior ambient lighting is. It also has settings for the exterior lights. This car has the intelligent light system which is basically adaptive lights that adjust as you drive with auto high beams and cornering lights. You can also configure how long it takes for the lights to turn off after you lock the car, a nice feature to have to light up your surroundings after parking at night. In vehicle settings you have some other basic options with the most important being auto folding mirrors and automatic door lock. You can also enable an audible lock sound but personally I find that annoying. You can even view the owner's manual from the display. Moving into the system settings there are even more things that you can change. You can configure the design of your digital instrument cluster and choose if you want extra things like navigational information or fuel consumption to be displayed alongside it. There's also a brightness toggle and a night mode. There are all sorts of extra settings in these menus and you could probably spend hours going through each one, but honestly it's a bit overwhelming when you're learning all of this stuff for the first time, especially considering that you can control the main display with the touchpad from the steering wheel or the touchpad and the scroll wheel below the screen. There's also another set of buttons and switches on the other side of the steering wheel to control the digital instrument cluster. For me, there's just too many buttons and switches. The first thing I noticed when starting the car, after the cool light show, is how loud the engine is. Immediately I noticed how much louder it is compared to my BMW which has a 3 cylinder 1.5 litre petrol engine. In theory, the BMW with the 3 cylinder engine should be louder and less refined than the 4 cylinder 1.5 litre Merc engine, but this isn't the case. At night, the interior looks really cool. The ambient lighting makes the cabin look very classy and although the displays are big and bright, they don't distract you from the road which is very well lit by the LED lights. I was also impressed with the quality of the reversing camera in the dark. So now I'm taking the car for a drive on the road. Now that's about half, about half throttle. The engine is really, really loud, even at idle. Uh, when you first started off, I was surprised at how loud it was. The indicators are quite interesting because I can't really hear them when I use them, so I'm not sure if I've indicated correctly. I don't know if you can hear that, but the indicators are really quiet. There's something about it that makes me not want to drive this car fast. When I'm when I'm driving this car, I feel like doing under the speed limit. It's very strange. When I drive my own car, I just drive to the speed limit and it's fine. But when I drive this, I feel like I want to drive it slowly. Um, and it's not because it's like I'm scared of driving it. It's the complete opposite. I'm very comfortable driving it. It feels like it's a car that's meant to be driven in a very slow and steady manner but the actual driving feel right now is it's okay there's nothing more to say about it really it's it's not it's not an exciting drive it's not a special drive uh, it's just it's just okay Driving the C200 Coupe is an interesting experience. The first thing I noticed was how light the steering is. This made for a very relaxed driving feel. Even though the steering is light, the car still feels quite heavy when cornering and has quite a lot of body roll. Straight away you can tell that the car is not set up for a sporty drive. It's much more suited to comfortable cruising. Most of my driving is done around town. The Mercedes excelled here in terms of manoeuvrability and parking. I found the turning circle to be quite good and the built-in parking assist along with the sensors and rear camera made parking this car a breeze. Here's a sample of the car parking itself. 
I simply drove forward slowly until it found a space, then I stopped the car and the car began to steer itself while I modulated the brake pedal. My passenger who was recording was paying close attention, as was I, to make sure that the car didn't hit anything. At one point he thought it was, hence why the camera was pointed so low, but actually the car did a really great job at getting into quite a tight space with very little room on either side. It does everything for you, including switching between drive and reverse. It takes a few manoeuvres to straighten up, but the final result is bang on. Be aware though, that it will not get you back out of that space, that's up to you. In normal driving, I found that the gearbox didn't really know what to do. At low speeds it often revved out in lower gears when it was completely unnecessary, and at higher speeds it shifted gears seemingly at random. Even while using cruise control at 70, I found the car was shifting gears to maintain its speed on the slightest incline, and this would make for a jerky ride, as you can often feel the shifts. I watch it shift from 9th to 8th to 7th, and then back up to 8th and 9th, in the space of 20 seconds whilst using cruise control at 70 on a dual carriageway with a tiny incline. My BMW has no problem with its 8 speed automatic box staying in 8th gear the whole time, offering a much smoother drive. Whilst using cruise control I found that it struggled to maintain the selected speed, often going above it and blinking the posted speed limit sign on the cluster at you. Pair this confused gearbox with an engine that at its best I would call unrefined and a chassis that is only really suited to comfortable driving, and you have a car that demands to be driven sensibly whilst randomly revving out at low speeds and somehow struggling to maintain motorway speeds with cruise control, making comfortable driving not as comfortable as it could be. I also want to mention the start-stop system which can be quite annoying as it turns the engine off while you are coming to a stop at very low speeds. This means in traffic, the engine will turn off before the car has actually stopped moving, and when you let off the brake and hit the gas, you need to wait for the engine to turn on again, but you haven't even come to a stop. The loss of power while the car is moving is quite unnerving. Luckily you can turn this off, but it does turn itself back on every time you start the car. In this clip I'm driving the car back to the dealer, and you can see how easy it is for me to reverse park it by using the sensors and the camera. Is the drive as bad as I'm making it sound? No, it really isn't. I'm comparing it to my BMW which does comfortable and sporty driving very well for a much lower price. Looking at the Mercedes by itself, the car is absolutely fine. It's comfortable, it's easy to drive, there's tech coming out of your eyeballs and it's fast enough to overtake easily. It sits in traffic nicely. But do you want a car that's just fine when it has an on the road price of over £42,000? Overall, I feel that I may have been a bit harsh. In reality, the C200 is a nice car. It has great looks, good overall performance and plenty of technology to keep the car relevant for years to come. I think the reason why I found myself judging it harshly sometimes is because of the price. I really think that the on the road price is a bit too much for a C-Class. However, nowadays most people are buying cars on finance and it's all about what's an affordable monthly payment rather than the full price of the car. Even still, with this car's on the road price being over £40,000, it's subject to the higher rate of road tax which means that instead of the normal £150 per year for this engine, it would be more like £450 per year. Luckily, the used car market is great for these cars as they depreciate very quickly. As of September 2020 when I'm making this video, there's a 69 plate C200 AMG line premium just like this car, with 1,000 miles on the clock for sale, priced at £31,600. That's more than £10,000 off the original price and it's still brand new. There's also some slightly older 68 plate cars between £23,000 and £25,000. When looking at a car at this kind of specification for between £25,000 and £30,000 rather than over £40,000, I'm much more inclined to consider it. 
Finally, I just want to mention that I'm not a journalist or a car reviewer, I just wanted to make a video showing what an average person thought about this car, so I apologise if I missed anything out that you were hoping to learn. Thanks for watching.